Good afternoon. My name is Don Kojane. I'm the president of the Parent Foundation. Before we honor Bob Noyce, uh, our collective hero, I would like to honor some local museum heroes, which you may not know, but uh, without them, this museum wouldn't function. Uh, I'll call them my local heroes at the moment, but they're the guys that make this engine go. Uh, most of them are uh, parent board members, except Bart Lee, <laughs> who is our resident uh, attorney and friend. Uh, let me uh, introduce or embarrass them in public if I can today. The first guy I'd like to embarrass is uh, Jim Weldon, who is standing next to a, a video recorder. Uh, he's what I call our Renaissance man, similar to Bob Weiss. But uh, Jim, just to show you the wide range of his interests and skills, he's a double E from Nebraska. He rides a BMW motorcycle an author, writer. I guess he's written some manuals for you in the uh, Intel, so he has some working knowledge of microprocessors as well. He also runs a desktop publishing company, ham radio operator. He's an environmentalist. He's also responsible for the program which you're reading. Um, also the 4th of July invitation, which you'll find in a packet I don't see many packets. Where is Norm? I think each of you, before you leave, should get a packet, a white envelope, uh, roughly 9 by 12, which has a lot of material about Bob Noyce in it, and it's uh, worth reading. And in there is an invitation to a 4th of July party at, uh, where's my wife, at our house. It's to honor all of the volunteers that we have here at the museum, but uh, all of you are welcome, obviously, if you can make it. Oh, Jim is also a computer expert, at least what I call an expert, and keeper of our mailing list, and a good friend. Have you been summarily embarrassed? Enough, <laughs> enough. <laughs> Uh, the second gentleman who will be speaking later is uh, Dr. Cy Stein. Cy, why don't you stand up? Cy is a previous uh, president of the Parent Foundation. And uh, although he says he's retired, I don't believe it because he's involved in more activities than I can keep track of, including a lecture tour that has him wandering all over this country. He can explain what he talks about better than I, but uh, uh, I'm impressed. Sai will talk to you later in this program. George Durfee, he is in the back of the room on the camera. George is uh, in charge of our sessions committee, which means that he stands at the back door and passes on whether we should accept uh, a piece of hardware as a priceless artifact or a piece of junk. <laughs> and uh, we obviously have differences of opinion on what some of these things are, but George is in charge of that delicate task. Oh, and his wife Edith is helping with, with the food upstairs. Norm Rabine, you stand up. Where is Norm? There he is. Norm, uh, I guess you're in charge of passing out white envelopes today. But uh, Norm is one of our senior board members and always uh, a reliable right arm when they need hard decisions made in terms of putting a perspective on problems which I don't fully understand, but a valued member of our board. Will Jensky, where is Will? There he is. Will is our resident expert on art antiques. 
Uh, one of the trips we're going to be taking next Saturday, the 30th, is to, uh, you might put this on your itinerary, is a new museum, which is part of the state park system called the Marconi Conference Center. And it's on the site of the old Marconi transmitter facility, which was built, I believe, in 1912, up at Point Reyes. And we're going to go kick around some of their warehouses over there and see what is of value. But one of the things they want us to do is to create an exhibit for their museum, which they're going to create, uh, obviously, an exhibit on Marconi. And it turns out we have a lot of Marconi artifacts here. In fact, a lot of things that came out of the old RCA station at Point Reyes, which first was a Marconi station, are housed here in the museum. So we probably have more artifacts than they do, and we're going to help them create a small exhibit to uh, uh, tell the Marconi story. Anyway, um, Will is my expert tire kicker, who's going to go up and tell me whether any of their parts are of value or not. And um, he is an expert appraiser in that, in that arena and a, a valued member of the board. The, the other gentleman I'd like to introduce you to is Bart Lee. Bart, you want to stand? Bart Lee is our uh, is not a board member, but he is the attorney that is taking our case uh, to Superior Court. We have a trial date of uh, September 6th, I believe, in front of Judge Fogel. And um, he is the best thing to come along in a long time for this museum. One of the things that I would like to do today to honor Bart, since he should be honored for all the extracurricular work that he's put in in our behalf, is a, a uh, not a painting, but it's actually an artist's rendering, I think it's uh, in charcoal or in pencil, of the museum. And please step forward. service it was beautifully done 
and uh, Intel was nice enough to get us a copy of that service. It runs a little over an hour. And what I plan to do is just show you a part of it, as I said, at the end of the talks. And then about 4.30, uh, if any of you want to stick around and see it in its entirety, I will show it end to end. It's a little over an hour, and it's really well done. It was created, I guess, collectively by Intel, right, Jim? Uh, and it is worth seeing. The other video is a fundraising video. Let me explain something about that. Uh, Mike Adams, who is not here today, who is a member of our board, is a professor of video production at San Jose State. And then several years ago, when he was living in L.A., he put together a six-part series for PBS called The Radio Collector. And it deals with antique radios and how to restore them. It runs over two hours. And uh, we are currently promoting its sale as a fundraiser for the museum. And one of the point of sale places is obviously the museum. But we intend to market it through a variety of distributors in the antique business, antique wireless, antique radio business. And there are a number of them scattered around the country. Uh, I want to play just the first few minutes of this video uh, so you get a flavor of what it is and what it does. Hold on. Clay and retrieves a radio which he's going to restore. Paul, so I wants me to talk into the mic. He's an experienced speaker and I'm not. <laughs> anyway, he buys this radio. It must be 1925 vintage and spends an inordinate amount of time with a half a dozen expert friends of his restoring this radio and this is what is portrayed in this two-hour video along with all of the history of radio. So it's really fun and I guess it's been playing upstairs. I don't know if you've seen part, parts of it, but it is in continuous run upstairs if you want to look at it. I think what I'd like to do now is introduce our first speaker, who's Dr. Sai Stein. Uh, since I've been monopolizing this microphone too much, but Sai is uh, ably prepared to talk about Bob because he knows Bob better than I. Sai? Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It was with some trepidation that I accepted the assignment <coughs> to address you this afternoon. As a matter of fact, I think I was chosen in the mistaken belief that I was an intimate friend of Robert Noyce. Now, this mistaken belief is understandable, and I'm happy to tell you why. Although Bob Noyce and I only met about four times, maybe five times, and we probably spoke to each other no more than four times on the telephone. It was characteristic of Bob Noyce to make you feel like a close friend on your very first meeting with him. We were introduced to each other by a mutual friend, uh, Frederick Barry of Philco Ford. Now, on certain occasions, Fred could be extremely formal. I remember him saying something like, uh, Robert Noyce of uh, Fairchild Semiconductor, uh, meet Dr. Seymour Stein, medical director of NASA's Ames Research Center. Bob and I shook hands, and both of us burst out into gales of laughter when we simultaneously interrupted each other with the words, just call me Bob, just call me Sai. This meeting, I believe, occurred sometime in 1960. The meeting that Fred and I had with Bob Noyce was supposed to result in Bob 
getting Fairchild to pledge a sum of money to the Perman Foundation so that we could build this building. But instead, Fred and I were told in no uncertain terms that he, Bob, had no intention of asking Fairchild to make a contribution. Money at that time was being very short in supply. And he never mentioned the fact that he had already pledged a sizable amount of his own personal funds, which I imagine was also very short supply at that time, to the then president of our organization. Bob strongly believed in the purpose of our foundation, to provide a permanent home for the priceless electronics, artifacts, and archives housed in this building. In subsequent meetings, Bob and I recognized a mutual interest. I was interested in applying modern technology to ease the suffering of patients. He was interested in developing modern technology to improve the lot of all mankind. He was a firm believer in scientific education and knew that the future of science rested firmly on a good knowledge of past scientific accomplishments. And this museum is dedicated to that understanding. After I returned, retired from government service in 1970 and became a professor at San Jose State University, I didn't have occasion to see or speak about mice. Bob's wife, Ann Bowers, has said that he frequently forgot them sometimes leaving his keys and or items of clothing in hotel rooms, etc. Well, I'm here to refute that statement. When I called Bob recently to request a statement from him regarding the contribution he made to the Fernal Foundation in the 60s, I assumed that a man with his myriad responsibilities would have long forgotten a casual acquaintance like me whom he hadn't seen or heard from in almost 25 years. I began our conversation by saying, uh, my name is Cy Stein, and you probably don't remember me, but without hesitation, without a moment's hesitation, he interrupted me and asked, are you still the medical director at Dean's Research Center? When I recovered my equilibrium, I told Bob about the foothill in the ends of college district's decision to no longer allow the Perm Foundation to operate the Electronics Museum and of the district's intention to convert the building to other uses. His reply was, they can't do that to us. I said I didn't think they could either, but they were certainly trying. I don't know what Bob had in mind when he said, they can't do this to us. But one thing I am absolutely sure, he still considered himself one of us. The Perm Foundation thought there ought to be some small way to let Bob's family, his colleagues, and the general public know how we feel about the loss of our friend and great humanitarian, Robert Nice. And it was because of our desire to express that feeling that we're gathered here. Sai gives me an opportunity again to state some of the goals of the Parent Foundation. Now, right now we have approximately 150 members. Uh, one of our goals is to a year from now have something in the order of 500. Right now we have 20 volunteers. A year from now we'd like to have 100. Right now, uh, the aspect of a permanent home is a little up in the air, although we think we're gonna win this suit. Um, right now we have uh, literally zero in the bank. Our eventual goal is to have a $2 million endowment so that this fine institution of a museum will have a uh, permanent way of maintaining a staff 
minimal staff, $150,000 a year budget for three people. Right now we are uh, hard hit to create new exhibits like the one that you see on this wall, a fitting tribute to Bob Noyce, since it details how silicon is used as a semiconductor and also the planar process, which he was instrumental in. We have four or five new exhibits that we'd like to create. One on lasers, one on satellite communications, uh, and a variety of others. One of, oh, the, other, the other one is local area networks. Some of the programs that we're involved in as a museum uh, relate to EMARC. Uh, Stu Fox is the current president of EMARC, which is uh, uh, the Electronic Museum Amateur Radio Club. Stu, you want to stand up? One of the uh, one of the great things that Stu and his organization do, or does, is they have uh, classes for new amateur radio operators. They graduate, uh, I guess twice a year, a, a host of what we call novice operators. Uh, and these people, to me, are beautiful to watch because they have a lot of hands-on skills which you don't find in graduate, graduating engineers coming out of college today. So whenever I find an engineer that is a ham radio operator, I have a lot of respect for them. So one of the other programs that we've started which seems to have a lot of appeal, particularly the eighth graders, is the building of crystal sets. It's one of the few unique experiences that a kid that's eight years old can create something with his own two hands that works from start to scratch, from start to finish, excuse me. Um, I don't think there's anything more pleasurable than watching an eight-year-old realize for the first time that his crystal set works. The other program that we have is the docent pro program for training volunteers. Uh, and we will be starting that again. And I think we have to develop, as I said, we have a goal of 100 volunteers who are experts in what we have here as a collection. So I'd like to uh, encourage any of you who are interested in that kind of activity any of you who have offspring who might be interested in that activity or friends, please refer them to me or anybody on our parent board. A few comments about my reaction to Bob. As you know, uh, we historians think about people in terms of uh, how they will be remembered 200 years from now. I suspect we will remember Bob 200 years from now. As an entrepreneur, he obviously created directly or indirectly more jobs in Silicon Valley than anybody I know. I have an example. This is a, uh, a history. This happens to be Shockley over here. <laughs> and this is Fairchild. And I don't know if you've seen this before, but there are roughly 127 companies here. And as someone remarked previously, there are probably 4,000 vendors created servicing those. So historically, this is what uh, Bob was creating. 
Our next speaker uh, is Dave Packard. I must apologize that the only artifact that we have here uh, about Dave is his first uh, audio oscillator. I don't know if you can see it from where you are, but it's this gray box behind me. This was Dave's first product. Uh, we display it proudly. I only apologize that uh, we don't have a bigger display. Dave Packer. I think if you really look at the contribution that, that Bob Morris made to the progress of electronics, he has had a multiplying effect here, which I think is the greatest than anything that's ever happened before. If you look at most of these exhibits, including the one up to early days, they have a rather small number of active elements of the German capability. Then we got into solid state technology. But because of Bob's contribution, this technology has been multiplied millions of times. And it's a, it's a whole new ball game. And it's been a, a tremendous contribution. And I think it's a great thing for the Parent Foundation to have a record of this. <coughs>
think also many of the urban leaders, and certainly Mr. Bob Bryce a great contribution, recognize that successful companies are successful in part because of the environment that they exist in. That the quality of life, the level of the education system, and all of those things which made it possible for those companies to attract the highly skilled and technical people. And they recognize this uh, not simply as a responsibility, but really in their self interest because they were going to be more successful in this time. They were able to help the community build a quality of both in terms of economic planning and in terms of quality of life. I think you all recognize that Bob Norris was one of our great leaders in trying to preserve the leadership of American technology in the world. Now, <coughs> there's been great concern about this as we're moving on to Japanese. I'm not concerned, but pessimistic myself. But Bob, I think, can serve our country very well in trying to do the work the whole United States industry and people at the state and the federal level. And the importance of providing those things that really help our country maintain this very impressive leadership that has been built up over the years and that is really the theme of this exhibit here at the Parent Foundation. So, again, let me say I think it's very appropriate for this exhibit to be dedicated here in memory of Bob Norris, who is one of our great leaders, a great friend, we will all miss him, about his contribution. Uh, Andy Grove operates in a world which uh, I, I can't comprehend sometimes particularly when people talk about putting a million devices on a, on a chip that's probably less than an inch on the side, Andy. The, uh, I guess the concept of what a micron is, a micron line is, is kind of mind-boggling. I grew up in the microwave business, uh, microwave communications, and we have uh, things called gas vets, which uh, Steve Rupp knows all about, Steve. And uh, they talk about quarter micron line widths and so forth. And I guess Andy uh, mass produces a million devices on a chip with these kind of line widths, which is kind of mind boggling when you think about it. I brought an example of one of Andy's recent products, I guess. what he fondly calls the 386 chip. And I guess the most startling number here, if you look at the size of this chip, is that there are 275,000 transistors on that chip. Now, if that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what does. Anyway, if you have any detailed questions about this, <laughs> don't ask me, but Andy is available, I'm sure, after this lecture or talk to uh, describe what's going on here. Andy Grove. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, I think the most appropriate element of your this recognition, in addition to, of course, the several appropriate things, one, of course, is that this whole industry has been fueled as all of you acknowledged by Bob's work. The second one that a number of you may not know, Bob lived approximately five minutes from here. Uh, so, Hotel College was very much home territory to him. But the thing that I particularly find appropriate is the three categorization, inventor, entrepreneur, leader, with which you summed up Bob's existence. I had the good fortune of being associated with Bob for 27 years. And I've seen all those three elements intertwined from the first year of our acquaintance to the last. 
people have since his death asked a lot of questions about what kind of a manager Bob was. And Bob was not the kind of manager that you would think of when you hear the word manager. Bob would use exactly those three attributes to poke at you with his invention and lead you with a challenge of his ideas to come up with your own that would be better than him. This would be a very infuriating process, by the way, to be on the other side of it. You would want to make the man go away, want to shut up, uh, want to stop throwing at strange motions at you. But then after if you chase him away, you scratch your head and you took one of those strange motions and tried it out, and many times they worked. These notions came from different areas, with the invention of the integrated circuit, which was before my days, was one of those. Gordon Moore was an associate at the time, tells the story of how he thought Bob was a little weird when he came up with his idea to put that part of our operating idea. In the early days of Intel, I had an experience in a similar situation where we had a problem with one of those adapter 10 micron lines of metallization going over a step. We would crack at the step, just like concrete would step, we would uh, break if it went over a sharp step. So Bob, who was very adept as a glass blower in his earlier years, said, why don't you melt that whole step a little bit and round it off, just like you round it over a glass piece of glass if you held it in a flame. It was the craziest thought that anybody would melt one of the oxide layers. And the only thing that was crazier than that, that uh, it worked. Uh, uh, once we heated that uh, the vapors up, they, you would see later that the corners were rounded, the metal stopped breaking, and a major impediment from, uh, in the way of building complex integrated service was removed, and that uh, invention has resulted in a much less known but very, very powerful and important patent in this industry dating from the early 70s. That's how Bob operated. When in a completely different area, Bob realized that our industry was in major problems, major trouble because we were being overrun by forces much bigger than us, Japanese companies, 10, 20, 30 times our size, we were investing very heavily and uh, engaged increasingly in predatory pricing in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, Bob again came up with a strange idea. He called together his colleagues from the industry who were the heads of competitors, the three or four competitors, and said, look, it's a big deal. We are the first in line in the electronics industry that are being picked off. We need to get together and not count on this organization of 2,000 companies with all their old concerns to represent us to the government. And out of this idea, the formation of the Semiconductor Industries Association came, which for the size of this industry has become one of the most lucid, one of the most focused, and most effective forces in educating our society and the government and causing action uh, by the semiconductor trade agreement to slow this process down and fight back, fight back against it. It was the same Bob Lewis process, thinking the unthinkable, challenging, poking at the participants, annoying them sometimes, but creating something that wasn't there. So it was the answer to the question of what kind of a manager Bob was, he was an inventor manager. He invented, he innovated in technical things as they would uh, refer to in management practices and in industry affairs in very much the same way, using his never resting sparking brain to stimulate those around him. And when those around him got going, Bob was never in the way. He never asked for, never postured himself in the way of getting acclaim or 
credit and probably the, the most power, powerful element of the management style was the fact that that was about people going away, you let all the credit go to them, and let that force fuel the process of their activities. So that was about a few words, and I consider myself fortunate to have been in orbit for all these years and the, the memorial service that I've done referred to. It was very interesting to see people who came from all over the place, all over the world actually, uh, people who haven't seen Bob uh, for maybe a couple of decades who come, pay their respects to Poland in particular, just to Bob memory, thanking him for having them in the service. is show you a brief expert excerpt of the videotape that was created by Intel of the memorial service last Monday at the San Jose Center for the Performing Arts. I think it was attended by some 2,000 people. The highlight of it at the end was a, a flyover by Bob's pilot and friend in his jet, which I thought was really neat. He didn't do a roll, but it was still exciting. Anyway, bear with me and we'll see a few minutes of Bob Noyce. Necessity in our society today. And I think the time is here for inventing new approaches, new solutions to these various problems so that we can indeed maintain America and indeed the rest of the world as well as the land of opportunity for all those who will be the achievers of the future. As I said, uh, that one hour tape, all we saw were a few minutes of it, is a great tape if you want to stick around. I'm guessing that we'll probably show this thing maybe at 4.30. We'll show it from beginning to end if you have time. Uh, I know that Intel produced that tape. I'm not going to commit them in advance that so they'll get you a copy, but uh, I guess I'll be, am I able to make copies for friends of the museum, or is that a proprietary product? Thank you. Anyway, it's worth seeing if uh, you have the time. The ladies, uh, Alicia, my wife, and Edith Durfee, uh, Durfee has uh, prepared some refreshments upstairs. Uh, one final act <clears throat> uh, that uh, I'd like to acquaint you with, it, and that is the creation of a plaque which will reside on this wall. Would you believe this is a prototype? <laughs> the plan is dictated by the board of directors mainly Cy Stein, is that we're going to create a bronze version of this plaque, which will be permanently affixed to this wall right here. So the first thing you do when you travel down Silicon Road, is you see uh, uh, Bob Noyce. Hopefully we can uh, embellish it with a photo with your help, Jim. Uh, we have started recently a tradition of honoring uh, some of the speakers that appear at our museum. And it is a memento which I can only show you at the moment. 
But what it is is a T152, which is produced, was produced by IMAC. It was their first tube, I think. Right, Merle? Help me with this. I think IMAC was started in St. Carlos in 1934, is that right? I believe in a little storefront on El Camino Real. Uh, and would you believe that this tube is still in production today? Now we talk about obsolescence, or technical obsolescence in the valley. And the fact that something that hits the market will be obsolete in six months. Well, here is an example, ladies and gentlemen, of a tube that has been in continuous production since 1934. So we thought it would be an appropriate emblem of appreciation to our guests. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to send this to you, Dave and Andy. But this is what it looks like. This is uh, Bill Itell and Jack McCullough's first tube. And uh, since they're in production continuously, we shouldn't have any trouble getting two more. <laughs> but we're going to put an appropriate uh, piece of brass or bronze on here with some words and music that say thank you. You'll be getting this in the mail. Thanks a lot. That ends the, uh, the ceremony. Thank you.